In the TV sitcom Friends, there is an episode where the, the group is discussing old movies. And the conversation turns to the movie Old Yeller. A story about a dog in his golden lab. Anyone ever hear of that story? <laughs> Phoebe, the uh, Dixie Blonde in the, the series, gushes about what a wonderful, happy story that is. And her friends stare at her incredulously. Old Yeller? Happy? This is a story about the love between a boy and his dog, and then the boy has to shoot the dog because it's been bit by a rabid raccoon. No, it hasn't, she says. It's happy. It all ends happy, and nobody dies. We've I've watched it many times. And it turns out that her mother had always stopped the movie before the bad part because she didn't want her children to experience anything horrible. <sighs> well, it seems that the compilers of this week's lectionary had the same thing in mind because according to the lectionary, the reading stops just when the Magi are overjoyed they brought their gifts to Jesus. End of story, next week we go on to Jesus' baptism. And it's all good. <laughs> Only, not so much. We wish it were that simple, that lovely, that clean. But it's not. In the midst of joy and suffering in this story, what can we take for our living? in 2013. 2013. That's where we are. This story is rich in symbolism. In the Magi pilgrimage, we find an openness to vulnerability, a willingness to seek the higher good, to recognize the holy no matter what it looks like, to recognize it, to revere it, and to be changed by it in some way. If we today are not prepared to seek and be in relationship with God, and to be changed and challenged and to grow by it, then why are we here? The story is also a universal tale about what happens when power and greed are threatened. Devastation is poured out on the weakest and the most vulnerable in society. Have you ever wondered why the victims of war are called casualties? Casualties. Casual. Of little consequence. I just find it a strange way to use that word. How do we not, though, get stuck in these verses that are so disturbing, so disturbing that no one wants to put them in the lectionary, including the people who know the Bible very well? Oh, don't put that in, it's too nasty. But I think if people just read the happy bits, Jesus gets birthday presents and everyone goes away happy, end of story. Then we are devastated anew and without compass, without compass, by news of modern day brutality. And we wake up to it every morning, unless you're wise enough to wake up to some glorious music, but I perhaps foolishly wake up to CBC and the news, and hear of the brutal beating and rape of a young woman in India who has since died of her injuries, the rape and, in the process, racial hatred toward a First Nations woman in Thunder Bay. And of course, we know we are less than a month from the devastating school shootings in Connecticut.
The brutality goes on and on. And we can be stopped by it. We can be broken by it. Or we can believe and act in ways that say love is stronger than hate. Love is stronger than fear and greed. We gather together as a church not because we are pure and perfect. We gather precisely because we are broken and flawed. We are also tempted by greed and scarcity and a hundred fears that keep us from being authentic and generous. But it doesn't mean we have to choose to be destructive. We are here precisely because we want to choose a different way of being in the world. We want to be on a spiritual pilgrimage, as the Magi were, finding and honoring truth and beauty wherever we find it, and offering our best gifts to God, offering our best gifts to the ministry to which we are called, we want to be part of something bigger and more important than our own individual lives. Reinhold Niebuhr said, nothing worth doing is ever completed in our lifetime. Nothing worth doing is ever completed in our lifetime. But we can play our part in the bigger story. Even if we can never finish what we start, or if we're the ones to bring to completion or to the next phase what someone else has started long before us. As we prepare to go into another year together, as we seek again <coughs> to call, we seek again to call forth the best gifts that each of us has to offer. And the danger of working in a big and busy church is that we can see so much of what yet needs to be done. We can think of the things we should be doing or the things that someone else should be doing. And we forget the amazing daily gifts, the amazing daily ministry that goes on here day after day, a hundredfold from each person gathered here. This year, this epiphany, as you think of the gifts that God has given to you, to you to share in this community and beyond this community, I want to invite you to be part of a congregational gift. And this is a, a, a gift that um, I saw on a few friends' Facebook pages. The idea is to take an empty jar, and what is the empty jar we have? To take this at the beginning of the year, and as days go by, to write down moments of gratitude, delight, inspiration, humor, awe, transformation, appreciation, celebration. And if you're doing it this home, that, that means it, whatever's happening in your life. But I invite you to do this as part of, of the church. Whatever ministry is happening in this place, it could be gratitude for a pastoral visit, it could be gratitude for the great chicken noodle soup that the youth make. It could be gratitude for a fabulous anthem. It could be gratitude for a hug and someone and remembering that it's your birthday, like it is Christmas today. Those kind of things. Anything that is life-giving. Now the idea of the jar that I saw on Facebook is that on New Year's Eve, you open the jar, and you start reading it, and you read all fabulous things. 
but we're a pretty big family. And uh, so that might, uh, you know, and I'm not sure if you're all going to be here New Year's Eve. So what I would suggest is that we, uh, we break open the jar, well, not break it, but open it about four times a year. Start at Easter, the end of school, Thanksgiving, and around Christmas. And we just share with each other the beauty and the gifts and the ministry that is ours. Next week, uh, the children will be taking this jar upstairs, and they have their own jar, and they're going to be decorating them. And then they'll bring this one back for us to fill, and they will be doing the same with their jar upstairs. We, like the Magi, can be involved in life-giving, in gift-giving, as we open ourselves to a deeper relationship with God and with each other, offering our attentive listening, our prayerful openness, our personal abilities and qualities, praying that God will use all that we offer to bless the world.